This is Molly Presley, and welcome to the latest episode of Data Unchained. For today, I'm excited to invite a really interesting um, thought leading guest who is interested not just in the technology, but in the business objectives that organizations are trying to accomplish by making data an important part of their organizational assets. Cal Bronstein is the chairman and um, CEO of Robert Francis Group. Cal, welcome to the show. Oh, Molly, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You bet. So I've had the opportunity to meet with you a few times recently. Just the latest conversations we had, you were doing a webinar for you know, enterprises, financial services organizations that are looking to overcome a lot of the challenges of using data in a decentralized world. Um, I love to see the thought leadership you all are putting in place through Robert Francis Group. And here on this podcast, I think it would be great for you to tell the audience who may not know you just a little bit about you, um, your background and about Robert Francis Group. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, for, for those who are, can see the video, you can see I've got a lot of gray hair. So I've been around for a while. Uh, and I began my career on Wall Street working for IBM. And at that time, working with all the leading edge Wall Street firms that have high transaction volumes and high availability requirements. Um, one of the accounts that I worked for over time was the New York Stock Exchange, the ticker system that you would see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, was something that I was responsible for for a number of years. And then I moved on to um, managing a group for the TPF airline operating system. So all the major airlines that run uh, their reservation systems are all using that operating system as well as some financial services firms. And uh, what my team did in those days, one of the things that we did is we were the first ones to develop a storage locking mechanism so that you could share data across loosely coupled systems. So uh, up until then, everything was a shared nothing. It was a, every server had its own storage and this enabled it to have multiple servers access the same database and uh, needed to do that because they were doing over 50,000 transactions a second. And this was back in the 1990s before the internet. So that was pretty huge and it was on mainframes and it was running seven by 24 by 365. So we had some very interesting data and um, performance requirements, availability, et cetera, that we were doing then. So I dealt with that for a number of years and then I came to RFG uh, and as you said, I'm in the CEO area. We're our business advisors for IT executives, provide them information on infrastructure and business processes, which are things that I focus on all the time. And in fact, on the data side, one of the interesting things, Molly, is that I started working on a data governance council uh, since 2005. And the most fascinating thing to me is that since then to today, progress on some of the things that we said needed to be done for data has been very limited. There are still a uh, very small percentage of firms that have data stewards and people really responsible for the data. And a lot of that accounts for the problems we're seeing today. As you think about governance of data, and I was a DBA, that was my first technology job was being an Oracle DBA. And one of the things that I thought about as you were talking about some of your experiences, a lot of it was structured data. It sounded like data sitting in databases. And sometimes you saw a little bit better governments in a database because you had a person who was overseeing the structure of the database, the columns, the rows, all those types of things. But this has gotten a lot more complex, in my opinion, as you think about unstructured data that could be sitting in all kinds of directories, all kinds of structures. Um, do you see that the same way? I do. What What's interesting is that if you go back into the 1900s, uh, so um, we had a lot of islands of data that you were referring to and everybody was developing their own thing and companies were finally starting to think that data architecture was an important thing to go do and address and they were beginning to bring things together when two things happened. 
that changed everything. One is we had the dot-com bust, which had a big impact on all the industries. And one of the things that many of the companies did is eliminate their data architects. And so we lost some of that capability. All, all the enterprise architects, I shouldn't say all, but a good number of them all disappeared. And the second thing is that clouds came along and clouds made matter worse. Um, they created more islands of data. So life wasn't getting better. We've really multiplied the problem and we continue to do more so as companies uh, continue to find ways to move applications and create new applications on the cloud. It's a big problem that's getting worse. So what do you see the role of a data architect being if a company is thinking about their digital transformation or their 2023 budgets, whatever it might look like, where would you say they should be planning the data architect in? Like what business value will they bring? If you think about data, data is a or should be a corporate asset. And yet it isn't. We say it is. Everybody talks about it. You know, it's the data is the new oil and everybody's very thinking about it as a very important aspect. But the reality is we're not treating it that way. Data is under the control of applications. And it's been that way um, ever since we moved to Intel platforms. It, basically, they were shared nothing databases. As you know, as a DBA, everybody, every application was tightly tied to the database. And if you think about it from a pyramid standpoint, you had the um, application on top in the infrastructure control plane in the middle and the data on the bottom. And the only way that you could get to the data was to go through the application because the application owned the data. And that meant every time I wanted a new application with the data, I had to keep making more and more copies. So there's all this proliferation of data and no control and no architecture being put in place behind it. That needs to change. One of the reasons it needs to change is that we end up making 10 or more copies of the same data over and over and over again. And as a result of that, uh, it continues to grow and there's no control. And an architect really is there to do the control. You not only need a data architect, you need a data steward. Most companies have put in place CDOs these days, but the chief data officer is not really there to do what one thinks the title says they're there to do. They are not there as a chief data officer. They're really a marketing officer focused on making sure all the data is there so they can do the marketing that they want to do. Um, but they're not there to make sure the data is complete and the, the, um, uh, the lineage is taken care of, the integrity is good. None of those things they're really focused on. They're only making sure they have what they need for any particular uh, marketing campaign they're driving. So that's a big problem. I know that this concept of the layering of how you access the data and who owns it and does the organization or the application or the machine it was being created on own the data came up in a conversation on your recent webinar with and that David Flynn, the Hammerspace CEO, was on. And I think that was an interesting concept of where the data architect or the data owner should really be influencing conversations that if you could move your data up where any user, any application can interact with it instead of having it buried within a system. That's one of the big key pieces, I think, that helps accomplish this goal of making data accessible. Um, but it's a, it's a different strategy on how workflows run potentially, or certainly, and at least how IT thinks of data management. Um, so where do you see the role of IT in this? Is IT going to need to go out and um, put more controls on user behavior, or is this more about let the users work with the data where they want to and IT doesn't have to be so involved? Let's rethink first what that pyramid looks like. Because right? now, we, as we said, the application's on the top and the data's on the bottom. We need to invert that pyramid with the data's on the top. And in the middle is a metadata platform and the application's on the bottom. So that's that's a, a methodology that, in fact, Hammerspace uh, is using. And they're not the only ones, but they've, they've, they've created that environment and they work with that environment, which basically says 
that the data is a corporate asset. So the companies can actually know what they know, right? Before you couldn't really know what the information was because it was buried all over the place and you had multiple copies of everything. You could create a single version of the tr truth that the company could know about. And then through the metadata, it can be provided with different views to the various applications that are attempting to use it. And that's very key because now you can sit down when developers are trying to decide where's the data, what do they want, and rather than going out today and saying, cut me another copy and put it over here and do this and, and constantly create this myriad of duplications going on, uh, they could take advantage of the corporate data, understand it, create their own logical view of it, and take advantage of it without duplicating all the copies. So, it, and you need an architect to build this structure. You need somebody in charge of making sure that we built it right, we have all the lineage, we, we know everything we need to know about that and protecting it all the time and considering it um, as the golden copy that you have to make sure that is in place for the corporation and everybody can use it as they see fit. So it kind of seems like if you could reduce the number of copies of data, um, reduce maybe the number of silos that you're managing, maybe the budget for this data architect could come from reducing some of the infrastructure costs and putting your data to work in a more optimal sort of way as people think about budgeting. Yeah, unfortunately, it, what happened is people, the the companies thought about from a budgeting standpoint that hardware was far cheaper than people, right? Uh, as we, as the cost of hardware dropped so dramatically and people could just easily say, buy me another Intel server, get me more storage, or now move to the cloud, it's so cheap that they didn't want to spend the money for an executive or a, uh, a data architect to m monitor this data. So they just kept making more and more copies. And that seems to have been the, the traditional way everybody's approaching it. Those that are really thinking about data as a corporate asset have recognized that they have to change that approach. And they're spending the money on the architect or the CDO to do it right and reduce the number of copies. I think that the concept of, um, and you and I chatted about this a little bit as we were talking about this show, um, that even if you have the money and the desire to continue things the way you always have, that infrastructure and servers and hardware just aren't available now. So some companies, whether they want to or not, are being forced to think about new solutions because, I mean, I'm hearing lead times on hardware being sometimes 6, 12, even you know, 18 months, depending on what it is and how much you need of it. Are you seeing that maybe as a forcing function for these data architectures to have to be changed? Well, the supply chain constraints are forcing people to rethink about the efficiency and the sustainability of what they've done. Um, they don't necessarily have the processes in place or the people in place. So, you know, when you think about it, uh, back when you were DBA, people did capacity planning. They don't do that much anymore. They just assume when I need more, I can get more. I just go out and get it. That world has changed. It's gotten very expensive to run equipment these days. The cost of power has increased dramatically, particularly in Europe. Um, and the ability to bring in new equipment, as you said, is, is difficult, right? You can, to quote Henry Ford or paraphrase uh, Henry Ford, right? You can order as much hardware as you want. You just can't get it. And so uh, your choice is I have to deal with what I have and I have to be able to deliver more with what is on board today to meet the growth constraints. So I have to find ways to do that far better than I'm doing it now. And uh, so that is a big challenge considering that data is constantly growing at 20% or more for most companies. I think this is a, it's an interesting, it's almost kind of a circular conversation of we have these challenges, we can't get hardware, so maybe I'll go burst to the cloud or use the cloud for elastic reasons, which infrastructure wise makes sense. But again, like you, we started the conversation, it creates new silos. So putting some kind of 
architecture in place and then raising this data up no matter where it sits and making it accessible is really important. But you also brought up the concept of metadata and you talked about a couple of you know very specific industries, financial services, um, for example, that this type of metadata that you hear about enriching metadata, you hear about AI, but I think metadata is a bit different by each industry. Um, in, in financial services, how would you see metadata, enriched metadata coming into play? Where would that even come from? If I can, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier before we address the metadata issue. And that is people have been moving stuff to the cloud, but cloud providers are basically have their own data centers, right? That's that's their cloud. It, it is data centers and they're as constrained as everybody else. Amazon is extending the life of the equipment they've had in-house because they can't get more. Uh, Microsoft has made statements about people of their constraints and their challenges and, and telling some customers to expect performance problems, primarily because they're going to have to do more with less and that's impacting the performance. So um, you just can't say cloud anymore like people used to. If I can't do it here, I'll throw it out in the cloud. That solves my problem. Yeah, not not true anymore. They're just as constrained as everybody else. So um, we need to really think about that. That's a really good point. That's a really important point that it's not an infinite availability bucket either. Um, and certainly not necessarily in the regions or locations where you want it, um, but maybe not at all. So that's a great point. As we think about the metadata piece, how does this come into play? How does metadata help with these decisions? The, the value of metadata is when you think about it, that there's two ways to look at how you deal with data. You either bury the data fabric inside that whole delivery process, or you bake, break it apart. And the key is breaking the data fabric and making it separate from the data itself. So I can treat those two elements separately. It's one's a control plane, one's the the actual data itself. So you're duplicating the same type on the data side that you're doing on the application side when you're doing containers and all of the um, Kubernetes work and things of that nature that, that people have started to do and focus on on the development side. This, this enables the developers when they're turning over to and when they're asking the uh, data folks to deliver them something that they can be more responsive you know the as you know the way developers tend to operate is they do their work and then at some point in time they knock on the door of the the dbas and they say i need this please get it ready for me right and there is a limited amount of time. And in fact, if you look at some of the new tools that are available from some of the companies, it's a, um, it's a point and click to say, I want this database, create it, do this, do that, the other thing. There's no real thought going into it. And that just says all this replication. If you can create the metadata layer, so that you can define what it is logically that you're looking for from the data. You don't have to create new databases every time. You just have to create new views of the same database. And if you can create new views, then you can use the same data. You know, it sounds like we're doing something really new, but I'm I've been around a long time. We used to do that way back when people coded in something called COBOL, way back on mainframes. That was the same thing that people had to do way back then. Haven't changed. We just keep changing the platforms and the, the coding languages and everything else, but we really need to treat things the same way and really think about it as an asset and not as just something I can throw out there and duplicate all the time. So as we kind of tie up this conversation, I think that concept of, for those who are visual in the way they think, inverting that pyramid, putting the data on top, having this metadata control plane, and then kind of infrastructure sitting underneath is a nice summary of what we're talking about. Um, but, but what's the motivation for a business? There's potentially the need that they absolutely have to because their data is growing, but are there other reasons, other business benefits that a customer is going to get or an organization is going to get by 
rethinking their data architecture? Absolutely. There's a real payback in doing that. If you can actually get decent visibility into all of your data, it can affect your revenue stream, your margins, your costs, as well as all the support efforts that you have to go through. So there's a real value chain here. And when you think about it, um, cutting your cost structure pays off on the bottom line directly versus driving additional revenue. So it's far more cost effective to get the data where you can have a single copy of the truth and make that available to the executives so they can make very informed decisions. So um, extremely important and it seems to get lost in, in, the, in the weeds because we have uh, given up control of the data without really good data architects or data stewards. If the members of our audience who are thinking about where to learn more are kind of struggling with where to start on this, what would you recommend? I know Robert Francis Group, and this isn't a pitch for your company, but you do do consulting in this area. Um, where else would you point them to? There are some materials on our website for that. Um, but I, I do think people really have to start from a process standpoint. The, people tend to think about the technology. This isn't a technology problem. This is a people and process problem going back to the business and saying, what is it that you want to do? Where do you want to go with this? Because if you leave it up to IT and the individual groups, they are not motivated to solve this problem. Um, if you recall when they started doing the big ERP systems and the purpose of the ERP systems were to create a common database that everybody could use, uh, when companies started doing it, they picked one group to start it up and the corporate had to pick up the cost for the overall expense because that one line of business couldn't afford the full ERP infrastructure costs associated with it here. And you have something similar here. If you're going to change the way you operate and revamp all of this, um, it is not going to be done by the various lines of business. Somebody uh, at the CIO level and corporate level have to make a really informed decision to say, this is how we're going to change the business and we're going to fund this to make this happen. That's a, a great point. And I know that um, the company I work for, Hammerspace, we I sit on weekly sales calls and conversations. And I know this is an area that our teams run into is as people are thinking about data architectures and changing the way their workflows run, you know, can a individual IT person make this decision? Is it at the C-level? And I think that's a really good point is it's something that an organization is going to have to agree to overall in an overall strategy um, versus, you know, individuals spinning up their own little environments to do their own thing. So it is a bit of a shift as well. When you look at a lot of the groups, they all have these application development teams and they sit on the top. They're one of the most important. Data is down in the weeds. People don't think about the data. When the executives say, I want this information, they don't really think about data. They say, oh, what's the application that can get me this, right? This is the way IT interprets it. So it's always application focus, not data focus. And that's a mentality that really needs to change. So when we talk about inverting the pyramid, that's not just how it's handled inside systems. It's how the whole processes need to think, how people need to think, and making data architects and uh, people accountable and responsible for data data um, at a much higher level than they're currently being thought about today. That's great. That's a great conversation. Um, you know, I could talk to you for ages on many of these topics, but I think just covering in this show this idea of inverting the data pyramid, gain organizational awareness into ways they can drive better revenues, control costs, maybe overcome some of their supply chain challenges. This is a great conversation for today. And thank you for sharing your time and your experience in this area, Cal. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Molly. Thanks for listening to Data Unchained, powered by Hammerspace. To learn more, visit hammerspace.com. If you have a guest you would like to hear on the show, email me at molly at hammerspace.com. Mm -hmm.